Hey guys, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks, and this time I've got a full review for you on the Tier 10 Soviet heavy tank, the IS-7. When hull down, the IS-7 has some of the thickest armor in World of Tanks. Just check out these Tier 10 mediums, unable to do anything to it. Furthermore, the low-profile nature of the IS-7 allows it to face-hug its opponents into submission. And if that wasn't enough for you, how about it being the fourth fastest heavy tank in the game with regards to top speed limit at 59 kilometers an hour. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, stick around. I've got some ace tanker gameplay coming right up after I discuss the statistics of this vehicle. And if you have no interest in picking up the IS-7, I'll tell you how to crack its seemingly impenetrable armor. So let's compare the IS-7 to a variety of the other tier 10 heavy tanks. Immediately you might be disappointed to know that the IS-7 has the lowest DPM out of any of these vehicles, and it is much lower than the 113 which the vehicle closely competes with. The penetration however is not too bad, 250 millimeters will give you enough to be able to punch through most of your opponents without having to resort to premium rounds, but if you do choose to resort to premium rounds in this vehicle, they are excellent with 303mm of APCR penetration. The IS-7's main armament is 130mm S70, which has 490 alpha damage. This is a really nice chunk of health to take away from your opponents, and it is just that little bit sweeter than the 113 or the IS-4, and much better than the 120mm guns on the 215B or the E5. And really, the only other heavy tanks which you aren't going to be out trading are the super heavy tanks like the E100, the same alpha damage as the mouse, and also the Type 4 heavy. Sniping in the IS-7 is a rather tricky thing to do, however, because of the velocity of the shells. 900 meters, similar to many of the other tier 10 heavy tanks, means that you're going to have to give a significant amount of lead to fast moving targets. The IS-7 also has disappointing gun handling. 3.1 seconds aim time, that's the worst out of any of these vehicles, even worse than the 150mm gun that the E100 gets, and its accuracy is joint worse at 0.4 with that E100, which means that you're going to miss quite a lot of your shots at mid to long ranges at least. Now the dispersion is slightly better than the E100, which kind of makes up for this disparity, but when you compare it to the 113, the FV215B and the E5, which all have better gun dispersion than it, as well as aim time, your gun handling is truly awkward in the IS-7. The IS-7 has a fantastic top speed limit of 59 kilometers an hour, making it one of the fastest, at least with regards to top speed limit, heavy tanks in the game. With only the Object 260 being one kilometer an hour faster than it, and the top tier French heavy tanks, the AMX-50B and the AMX-5120, going at 65 kilometers an hour. And so this means that if you can get some momentum, especially when you're going down slope in the IS-7, you can quite often outpace even medium tanks and leave pretty much all other tank destroyers and heavy tanks in your dust. However, I stress if you're going down slope, and that's because the horsepower to ton ratio of this tank, while it's not bad with a very meaty 1050 horsepower engine, the power to weight ratio is just under 15 and a half, which doesn't look too bad, but unfortunately the IS-7 gets the worst ground resistances of any of these vehicles, even worse than the E100, which means that it's very unusual to actually get up to the top speed limit of the IS-7, and I'll be showing you that in the gameplay in just a minute. Furthermore, the IS-7 has a disappointing tank traverse speed of 28 degrees a second, which when you combine with these terrain resistances is much much worse than the 113, the FV215B and the E5, which can be very disappointing as the IS-7 often has to sacrifice a lot of the momentum that it's built up to be able to go round corners, which is very frustrating when you know you have that awesome top speed limit that you want to try and maintain. So, so far you've heard that the IS-7 pretty much has one of the worst guns out of any of these vehicles, with the worst weapon handling and not fantastic mobility out of the top speed limit, well you'll be happy to know that one of the reasons why the IS-7 is the most popular tier 10 heavy tank in the game is the armor profile. The IS-7 has one of the most dependable turrets in World of Tanks, just look how thick the armor is. Pretty much all over the front of it is 400 millimeters, and unless you can get above it to shoot down on the weak upper hatch and the cupolas, good luck even trying to damage the IS-7. Also, while the IS-7 doesn't have the thickest frontal armor in the game at 150 millimeters, as you can see by the unique shape of the design of the hull, this pike nose, it makes the 150 50 millimeters very effective indeed. At 200 meters, your frontal armor is pretty much 300 millimeters plus on the whole of the front of the tank. Unless your enemies manage to get your lower plate, but even then it's fairly well angled, meaning that you still have about 220 to 230 millimeters of lower plate armor. This means that there are many tier 8 and even tier 9 vehicles that just can't pen the IS-7 frontally unless they resort to firing premium at it 
even if they do get its weak point of being the lower plate. So your next idea might be, well, why don't I just angle my IS-7's armor to increase the effectiveness of my lower plate? And yes, if you do angle it about 45 degrees, the lower plate goes up to about 265 millimeters of effective armor. But then you're just covering up one issue to create another. And if you angle your lower plate like this, the upper hull armor is no longer angled, which means that you only need about 240 to 250 millimeters of penetration to be able to get through the IS-7. And that's at a distance. If you're up close and personal with the IS-7 and he angles his armor like this, and you're quite often taller than him, you can go through here with 200 to 210 millimeters of penetration. One thing to watch out for as well with the lower plate is when you're in close quarters combat and you're aiming down on the IS-7, its effectiveness does go up. The IS-7 side armor can be very confusing indeed. On the upper part, it is 150 millimeters thick, and it's also very well angled, so unless you get the enemy tank pretty much like this, it's going to be an auto ricochet. Then there's there's an area of armor under here which is less thick, 100 millimeters, but it has spaced armor protection of 30 millimeters. And so that makes this band of armor actually more effective than the thicker armor above it. And so if you're shooting at the side of an IS-7 and you have it completely flat, this is 240 millimeters of effective armor. So do not shoot this spaced armor bar here. You want to shoot above it where it's 200 millimeters of effective, or you want to try and shoot underneath between the tracks where the whole of the hull has only got about 120 to 140 millimeters of armor. Now, of course, you're not often going to get the entire flank of an IS-7. You're going to be pretty much aiming at it like this. If that is the case, don't try shooting this whole bar here. You want to shoot between the tracks where the vehicle has pretty much got about 200 millimeters. Or if you can make the shot, shoot at the front of the tracks, you're likely to take them off and only need about 180 to be able to go through here. And so this means with the IS-7, one of the worst things that you can do is angle the tank at 45 degrees. You want to angle the tank pretty much like this, going backwards and forwards, hoping that they're going to miss your lower plate, hit your upper plate, or get absorbed in your amazing side armor. So while the IS-7 certainly has some very impressive armor, it is not that resilient with regards to its health points. It has 2,150 hit points, only more than the Object 260 in the AMX-50B. And when you combine this with the poor DPM of the vehicle, that means that quite often a tank like a, a 113 or a T-125 can simply outgrind an IS-7 unless it can use its armor effectively. Thankfully, the IS-7, like all Tier 10 vehicles, has very nice view range at 400 meters, which should allow you to spot for yourself very effectively indeed, especially if you start to get things like situational awareness and recon on your vehicle. One final thing to mention is that the IS-7 is actually quite a heavy tank weighing nearly 68 tons. That is massively more than the 113 which is pretty much the weight of a heavy medium and surprisingly more than the IS-4 which you would consider to be the more pure heavy tank, right? And so what this means is that by going at 59 kilometers an hour with 150 millimeters of frontal armor and weighing 68 tons you can pretty much outram most vehicles in the game and so that's definitely something you should try out. So let's talk about equipment and crew skills for the IS-7. Well, obviously you're going to take a large tank gun rammer and vertical stabilizers. You'd have to be crazy not to. And so really it's only your third slot that is up for debate. And I do feel there are three legitimate choices to take with the IS-7 because its aim time is just so long at 3.1 seconds with pretty damn awful gun handling as well. Maybe you should use a gun laying drive. Alternatively, if you want to be able to spot your opponents at greater distances, then maybe coated optics will be useful for you. And this is certainly the case because I think you'd have to be mad to drop out the fire extinguisher, a repair kit, or a med kit on this vehicle, as it does seem to lose a lot of modules and because the fuel tanks are at the front, burn occasionally. No matter how tempting it is to use the remove speed governors in this tank to make up for its mediocre power to weight ratio and try and harness that awesome top speed limit. The final choice and personally the one that I prefer on the IS-7 is improved ventilation because that 5% crew skill is just going to add that all-round performance that I feel like the IS-7 needs. And as we can see here when you start to train crew skills like recon and situational awareness your view range in the IS-7 starts to get pretty decent anyway. Crew skills wise you want to take repairs first in the IS-7, then get six cents. Then once you've got onto your third skill, respect to be able to get brothers in arms on all of your crew as well. And really it's fairly standard stuff. I'd recommend taking recon on your commander. Don't really bother with camouflage on any of your crew skills until you've got nothing else to choose. And there's even an argument that you should probably take armor instead of camouflage on your gunner because your turret armor is so amazing. Often people just randomly shoot at it and hope for luck or fire high explosive at you. One thing I'd really like to highlight, however, is that while the IS-7 does have two loaders, they are not doing the same job. Your first loader in the upper slot 
is a pure loader. However, your bottom loader in your second slot is actually the radio operator as well. And so this means don't make the same mistake that I did and take safe stowage to improve your Amorax durability on your bottom loader. Instead, put it on the top loader because he's really got nothing else to learn. And you definitely want to take situational awareness on your second loader to be able to improve your view range. And remember, there's no point in having safe stowage across two crew members. But anyway, I think that's quite enough theory crafting. Let's get stuck into some gameplay. So firstly, I'm playing on Runeberg. And we're in a fairly nice matchup here. There are a hell of a lot of tier 8s on the enemy team. And those are vehicles that the IS-7 just loves to pick on. Of course, any tank that has... 225 pen here, STA-1, gosh, what does that have? About the same, right? The IS-3, 225 as well. The T-34s are more like 245. All of those kind of tanks are vehicles that the IS-7 just loves to bully. Now, you saw me make quite an aggressive play towards the center of the map at the beginning, and that's because I was thinking about going into the middle, but when I saw the bat chat duck in there, oh no, we can't make that kind of an aggressive play. Now, of course, the IS-7's top speed limit, you should try and think about what kind of funky positions you can get yourself into, but they shouldn't come at all cost. And I, if I'd rushed in there, I would have simply got obliterated by the Jagdpanzeri 100 above and the Batchat autoloader that was in there. We put a good shot into the Tiger 2, doing 541 damage to him, but just take a look at the aim time of the vehicle. We just, you have to just sit there. And remember, I've got some good crew skills in this tank. I've got Brothers in Arms, we're using... Um, are obviously vertical stabilizers. We're using vents instead of a gun laying drive, so definitely do take that into account. And I'm pretty sure I'm using snapshot on my gunner as well. So this is as pretty much as good as the, the aim time gets on the IS-7, of course, without using that gun laying drive. So I've decided to work my way into town. We're definitely going to have to have a positive role in this game. It's a 46 percenter. One thing that I should have mentioned that I forgot in the statistics is also the fact that the IS-7 does get 6 degrees of gun depression, which is far, rather efficient. And when you think that the vehicle is so low profile, 6 degrees is awesome. See, at these kind of ranges it doesn't really matter if you've got 3.1 seconds aim time and fairly bad gun dispersion values. Managed to put a good shot there into the, the side of the T-34. Not sure if we took his tracks off, didn't quite manage to see that. But we bounced two shells two high penetration shells. So I think, shall I shoot at the lower plate of the VK? Nah. Shooting at the lower plate of the VK is for suckers, right? So we might as well have a better chance of penning his cupola. Now, take into account what I did there. I angled my hull in, forced him to shoot at my side armor rather than hitting my lower plate. Those little movements are so important in the IS-7 and you're gonna have to be able to pick them up if you want to be effective in the vehicle. Now, I feel like that flank is safe because we've got a WTR Panzerfear and a Centurion that is going to be able to hold it. And now these kind of rubble bits and these undulations are usually where the IS-7 is just fantastic. Or at least, usually where the IS-7 is fantastic. I'm like, where does he pen me? And he actually shot me in the lower plate. And do you know why? Because I lurched forwards just a little bit, which wedged my lower plate up in the air, which allowed him to easily go through it. However, a couple of rounds into him... We've out-traded him. I definitely have a much better rate of fire than the 75, and so it would have been an absolute shame if I had traded one for one with him. Definitely be thinking about when vehicles have worse rate of fire than you, so you can out-trade them, because generally you, you have the mobility in the IS-7 to be able to, at least in these kind of close quarter engagements, outmaneuver other heavy tanks. So the VK's missed. We're going to have a shot up. Again, it is Coppola. We managed to go through. And I noticed there I was firing an APCR round. I guess it's because I was worried about these tier 9 German heavy tanks. And also the fact that my team are down by two vehicles, even though we've done 3,600 health worth of damage here. So I ignore the VK. I don't think I can pen him. Instead, we managed to shoot that lovely little bit on the T-34. Unfortunately, we leave him on five health. That was a bit of a low roll. One of the first proper low rolls we've had this game. 443 out of 490, leaving him alive. That's a bit of a shame. I can't quite manage to get a shot into the T-34 there. Fair enough, this tank is low profile, which is awesome, but unable to get one into the T-34. But that's a very juicy side shot into the Tier 9 German heavy tank. I was loading a high explosive round there because I wanted to just fire at the T-34's turret. The high explosive rounds in this tank are actually rather nice, but I don't take too many of them because the vehicle can't actually carry that much ammunition. I believe it can only carry 30 rounds all game, which is a little bit awkward. So we put a shot into the VK's track there, just decide to hold him still. He turns his turret to the side, 
and we're going to be loading an APCR round again here because I feel like I really want to finish him off. And he manages to track us. I completely whiff the shell. Bit of a waste there, but luckily he gets taken down. So now, now back to the AP rounds. Don't really need that APCR ammunition in this vehicle, but then again, when you're engaging tier 9 heavy tanks, and when you only can afford to really get shot four times in the IS-7 by those kind of vehicles, I guess you just don't want to, to mess up, right? And it's also because the DPM in the IS-7 is just really so bad. Uh, every single shell really counts in this machine. And if you don't manage to, to pen the enemy tanks, then you really can put a lot of pressure on yourself, especially when those two guys were operating in a platoon together. So 4,500 damage in just over five minutes. Not too bad. Unfortunately, we're unable to snapshot at the IS-3. And our team manages to take him out. Aiming, aiming, aiming. Okay, that's enough. Let's finish him off. Taking out the Batchat on the enemy team, I was very happy to secure the kill on that tier 10 French medium tank. They still got a Griller though. We're going to have to watch out for him. He's on three kills. Where is he? Well, he was last spotted in this location. It's very likely the enemy artillery are on the other side of the map. And you see me advancing using the buildings here to hopefully try and gain some cover from him and also to gain some cover from the enemy artillery. Hopefully these bushes will mask our approach. I really need to get towards this area here to be able to use these buildings to hide from the artillery on the enemy team. And I've also loaded a high explosive round here. My last remaining high explosive round in the tank. 68 millimeters of penetration, 640 alpha damage. And that should be enough to be able to devastate the grillers. At least his, his gun turret if we manage to hit him there. Oh gosh, he's on my left. He comes around the corner, he doesn't aim at me, and I just completely faff the shot up. I thought that I had not very long to be able to shoot at him. And I think, shall I go around the corner right now? And then that artillery luckily misses me and hits the building. Bit of a misplay there by me to go around the corner to try and pressure the gorilla. I think that was more of a frustration by the fact that I played badly and I missed my shell and he killed one of my friends behind me. But our knowledge of this little gap allows us to put a shell into him and he finishes off my ISU 152 who makes the sacrifice and of course I need to get around the corner and put a shell into him and at that kind of range fair enough it might have been a little bit of a heartbreak if we'd missed but I felt like we had enough health to be able to take a sh uh, one shell from the griller at least and finish him off and he's actually faster than us scary that that tier 10 tank destroyer and somehow the enemy bat chat I'm not sure if he kills himself or if he rolled his tank over but he manages to die, and he was actually here. So from here on, it's just a case of trying to hunt down the T-92. As safely as possible. I really wish I had that high explosive round left over, because he's got 500 hit points. So that means that we are a 50-50 whether we kill him. And we roll just a little bit high, which is enough to secure the kill on that tier 10 American self-propelled gun. So all in all, a solid result here for the IS-7 on Runeberg, as you would expect, definitely one of the better maps for this vehicle. But even with a couple of mistakes, we had a great impact and managed to carry a 45%er. Before we take a look at the post-game stats, let's get stuck into some more gameplay. So now we're playing on Abbey, and I'm going to show you when the top speed limit of the IS-7 can be rather useful indeed. Now on Abbey, it's one of the maps that if you choose to go down the, the east of it, that you want to progress as fast as you can. And why is that? Because generally the players that manage to get into the positions here for the enemy team and also here for my team are safe from the enemy artillery by using these lovely mounds here and here to avoid them. So of course that's what we're going to do with the IS-7. Now, this should give you an idea of the mobility of this vehicle. Ah, down to 35 because we we're going slightly up a hill here. And really, I don't think once in this replay you're going to see me get up to, to 59 kilometers an hour. Well, maybe you will. We'll have to wait and see. So along the flat here, the IS-7 goes along at pretty much about 40 kilometers an hour. Just up now towards 44. Down a little bit, 45. Yeah, that's, that's the kind of top speed limit, so to say, of this tank along the flat is about 45 kilometers an hour. We decide, well, that's another advantage of having that top speed limit being one of the fastest tier 10 heavy tanks, at least one that is very well armoured, is that we're able to, to spot that Tiger 2 and get him completely taken out by, oh wow, look at that old school, the WT Alpha 100. Yeah, this replay is from patch 914, um, so it's not that old. That was the, uh, the swan song, so to say, of that German tier 10 tank destroyer. Talking about German tank destroyers, here's a Jagdpanther 2. And this is where we're going to get rather lucky. 
Wow. I didn't expect that one to go in. That really shouldn't have gone in, but it did. Oh, but luckily we managed to find that pig. I guess he thought that he was going to be safe there behind the Tiger 2 and the Yank Panther. But, nope. And that's where having that 490 alpha damage is just rather lovely indeed, right? And this is the kind of way that I love to play my IS-7. Rather aggressive, try and take important locations, and then live by the sword, die by the sword, right? Trying to, to dig your opponents out. So we come around the corner, we find uh, a Waffenträger Alf Panzer IV. We put one into him. It looks like he hasn't managed to connect or something so far this game. That's a little bit disappointing. Now we're going to fire off the high explosive rounds, put one right into his turret there. Ooh, 601 damage. Taking a couple of high explosive rounds on your heavy tanks, I really recommend that you do it. Not only for just interrupting the caps, it's very useful for finishing off tanks on very low health, but more importantly, now that there are so many Grilla 15s around in the game, they can be very useful. And they were also very useful last patch for taking out tanks like the WT Alpha 100, right? So we fired directly at his gun, hopefully we broke his gun there. Possibly. Looks like he's finished killing tanks and now he's on his reload. And we're going to press forwards and see if we can put a shot into the AMX CDC. Yeah, we do. And now we're going to push forwards and go and get the WTR V100 as well. Just going to speed up the replay a little bit here. Oh, slow reactions by me as the VK4 202P manages to finish him off first. Now, this is another one of the great things about the IS-7. It's able to quickly be able to go back and defend. Now, I guess there are a couple of options available to me here, right? One is to try and secure the cap circle with my buddies, but I'm always worried about sitting in the cap circle here because you can get shot from the middle, you can get shot from up here. So I felt like it was better for me to be able to pull back to base to be able to defend my own cap. Especially considering also I've managed to pick up four kills and 3,000 damage and have all of my hit points remaining. So yeah, maybe a little bit of rush of blood to the head here. But exactly what I thought was going to happen did. The Spearpanzer in the middle finishes off the T-30, although you might argue that if I'd been there, maybe I could have provided cover for the T-30. Now this is a very interesting engagement here. You might think, well why did you shoot the side of the T-62A there? And that's because there is actually a rock that I had no idea about. Look at it, it's behind a tree. And that T-62A is making good use of that rock there. So well played to him. Firing heat rounds into my tracks, however, that's not really going to do it for him. And this is how I recommend that you advance at people with your IS-7. You pretty much want to angle your tank like this and just drive at them. What that means is that any round on the side of your tank isn't going to work. They, and that may, puts the pressure on them to hit your lower plate. And that generally is how I've found that you can maximize your IS-7 health, or at least the effectiveness of your armor. And let's be honest, when you've got a tank which is rather low accuracy, 0.4, remember, one of the worst on any of the tier 10 heavy tanks, and also that, that horrible aim time and gun dispersion, this tank, at least for me, how I've managed to deploy it successfully, is best at up close and personal, or at least in short, very short range combat. I feel like that's where the IS-7 truly does triumph. So we didn't actually manage to do anything to defend the base there, but at least we went back and threatened them, right? Well, maybe also we distracted that T-62A for long enough for it looks like the WT to be able to finish him off from the side. Didn't quite see who managed to pick that up. So remember, IS-7's power to weight ratio isn't fantastic, and the ground resistance is also pale as well. So um, we're unable to get up here more than about 15 kilometers an hour. But now, once you've crested the hill up to 35 now up to 40. Now we're going to go slightly downhill, so we might actually see the top speed of the IS-7, but I don't actually accelerate going down this hill very quickly, because I'm kind of concerned that I'm walking into a trap that the TVP VTU and the T-62A might be setting. Nevertheless, let's go after this E-75. You'll notice that the first round I'm going to fire at him is an AP round, and now I'm going to be reloading APCR. And that's because, frankly, the frontal armor on the E-75 is an absolute pain in the backside for 250. And in this kind of situation, where I'm going to get flanked probably from his allies, it's far better to have the APCR rounds just secure the shots. Now I want to reverse because I'm really worried about the, v the TVP VTU or the T62A flanking from the side. But luckily, the ISU manages to finish off the E75, so we don't have to worry about that, and we can keep on plowing forwards. And this is where the IS-7 is just rather lovely, you know. Um, it's able to just hound down its opponents at the end of the game. Many of the, the very heavy tanks like the E100 or the, the Type 5 Heavy or even the Mouse just simply can't do that. 
And many of the other tanks, such as the, the IS-4, also struggle to be able to get around as quickly as the IS-7. And it's these kind of momentum, it's this kind of momentum that you can build up in the IS-7 that can really surprise your opponents. I'm not sure if that TVP V to you really figured out that I'd be coming down there as quickly as possible. Um, did I just track him, which made him roll over? Hey, it wouldn't be an IS-7 tank review unless we rammed something to death, hey, right, guys? We do... how much is that? 251 to him there and only take 52 in reply. And now this is going to be an interesting engagement against the T-62A at the end of the game. We put one into him and we find out he's firing heat, so I want to try and overangle my armor. And the reason for that is that I want to be able to get him to shoot down into my tracks. It looks like... See how I'm angling my armor up here? I'm basically trying to make it difficult for him to fire. Because if I give him a flat surface to fire at with the heat rounds, it's going to be going in. So what I have to do is just make it tricky for him. And he auto-fires the heat round at the side of my tank there. Probably gets absorbed into the space armor. And that was three rounds in a row of heat ammunition that the T-62A fired that didn't manage to go through our tank. And so I think in that last engagement, he managed to pen three and miss three, which allowed us to reload four times and pretty much take out the entirety of his vehicle. But one thing you might have noticed in that final 1v1 with the T-62A is just how much pressure there is on the IS-7, at least with regards to the DPM disparity between it and other vehicles. Now, fair enough, the T-62A is an example of monstrous DPM, 320 alpha damage, nine rounds a minute, that's absolutely scary. And our 2150 DPM just absolutely pales in comparison, but one thing that the T-62A doesn't have is this absolutely troll armor, which really is the key strength of the IS-7 and also the key aspect to you becoming a successful IS-7 driver. Not only do you have to consistently put all of your rounds in with your 130 millimeter, otherwise your enemies are just not going to have any pressure on them, but you have to be constantly adjusting your armor, wiggling it, using the terrain to try and make them miss. Because unfortunately for the IS-7, unless it's hull down, there are always weak points. Frontally, they're just going to shoot your lower plate. And if they manage to get your side armor like this, and they're just going to shoot down on the front here, or alternatively take your tracks off. But if you exert constant pressure on your opponents and make them miss, then even the 330 millimeters of penetration in this T-62A's heat rounds is quite often not going to be enough. So in our first round on Runeberg, we managed to pick up a high caliber medal for the 6,268 damage we did. We also managed to do a little bit of assistance into tracking, 1,100 of that nearly, and 1,162 base experience points. Even though we fired, I think, a couple of APCR rounds that game, we made 48,000 credits profit as well, and we took 3,160 potential damage, 2,180 blocked with the armor, only two of the enemy shells able to penetrate it. An all-round great performance for the tank, and we were certainly able to carry this game. Next up on Abbey, we also got a high caliber, but this time also were rewarded with a Top Gun medal for our kills. This time our base experience points was much more impressive, 1,428, and that's because we also did a lot of spotting, 2,460 to be exact. 800 of that was against the Tiger II at the beginning, 401 against the Jagdpanther II. Showing you that the IS-7's top speed limit of 59 kilometers an hour can be very useful for getting into aggressive positions, which frankly the enemy team didn't seem prepared for. This time we picked up 6,999 damage, and even though I think we fired a couple of APCR rounds, made a cool 65,000 credits profit. And that was nearly 7,000 damage in less than eight minutes. That was a bit of a riot of a game. And again, our armor held up pretty darn well. 10 hits received, four non-penetrating, 1,280 blocked, and considering a lot of the rounds that hit us with those heat rounds at the end, that's rather impressive. Giving the IS-7 the breathing room that it needs to be able to work that 130 millimeter with its awful DPM. So the IS-7, the most played tier 10 heavy tank in the game. And it's unsurprising considering a few of the vehicle's strengths, that awesome speed limit allows you to play aggressively, the completely ridiculous frontal armor, and even the side armor allows you to brush aside weaker opponents and even against opponents firing premium rounds occasionally come out on top. And while its 130 millimeter main armament is certainly not a highlight of the tank, it's enough at least to brush aside many vehicles that it can encounter. Now, of course, the i7 is not perfect, especially recently with the mass amount of players now grinding and playing the T110E5. It really does seem to struggle against that tier 10 American heavy tank, which will pop out round the corner and shoot you before you've even managed to half aim your ridiculous bloom with your awful aim time. And even then your 0.4 accuracy is not enough at least to be able to hit his weak points, which you kind of have to do now against an E5. But then again, if you want to play more of that mid-range sniper heavy, you probably don't want to pick up the IS-7 
and this is specialized for people who just like to get up in tanks' faces to use its ridiculous armor to laugh manically as they bounce round after round off you. Quite a lot of people get the IS-7 thinking it's going to be ludicrously fast because of that top speed limit, but if you're a medium tank driver thinking about branching out into heavies, I, I, I wouldn't be so sure about picking up the IS-7. You'd probably be best suited to going and getting the 113 as an example, which due to recent buffs has made it absolutely awesome. But I think that the IS-7 is certainly a vehicle that you have to eventually pick up in World of Tanks because it just has a unique armor profile, probably the most unique one in the game. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this tank review, or maybe it was just useful to you. If it was, please consider giving it a like down below, it really helps the channel out. And if this video has sparked your interest in the tier 10 Soviet heavy tank, then simply click through up here or use that more info icon in the top right hand corner of your screen to see some awesome IS-7 replays. And let me know in the comments down below what you guys think about the IS-7. Is it the kind of vehicle that you absolutely hate to meet because you can't seem to penetrate its otherwise seemingly awesome armor? Or maybe you picked up the tank and you absolutely hated it. If so, why? And as always, thank you. Thank you so much for watching, you've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.